Hello everyone, this is Decrypt. In this video series, we are going to learn how to exploit a buffer overflow vulnerability. Before we begin, if you haven't subscribed, please do. It will encourage me to keep producing useful content. Please hit the like button and share the video with your network. Let's begin. It is really important to learn and understand the basics of execution of a program in memory. The CPU is where the program is executed. So at a minimum, it can comprise of the control unit, execution unit, registers and flags. The registers are internal memory locations, which are used as variables. There are multiple registers types uh, that we are going to see near in this next slide. So they are broadly classified into general purpose, segments, instruction pointer and control registers. The registers ESP, EBP, and EIP are important to us, so let's take a look at what each of them does. So the ESP points to the top of the stack. So whenever we store or retrieve objects from memory, the ESP register is decremented or incremented accordingly. EBP points to the base of the previous stack frame. So what it means is it essentially points to the area of in-memory above the region where the current function is executing its instructions. EIP, the address of area in memory that has the next set of instructions to execute after the current function is returned. Let's take a look at memory. Ideally, the CPU leverages the random access memory as temporary buffer to store and retrieve objects for execution. The physical memory has a start address and an end address. So the physical memory will be divided into chunks of virtual memory spaces, and these chunks are then assigned to processes However, the process will not know that it's inside the virtual memory and thinks that it's enjoying all space available on the system. So let's take a look of, uh, at the virtual memory stack, right? The virtual memory and what all the virtual memory consists of, right? It kind of consists of a start and end address as usual. The end address or the highest memory region is occupied what are called stacks. So the lowest or the start address, uh, the lowest memory region or the start address is occupied by the program code. So that's the dot text here, and the top of the memory is the stack. Stack stores the arguments passed to the function as well as its, its local variables. Stack. So we're going to focus about focus on the stack for the rest of this video series because we're going to exploit a stack-based buffer overflow vulnerability. To store an object in the stack, we use push operation, and to retrieve it, we use a pop operation. So a stack is essentially a last in first out data type uh, data structure. And when you push or pop, we're talking about assembly instructions here. In, in a 32 bit architecture, the addresses are four byte long. And as a point of reference, an, an English alphabet, uh, for example, the A is a one byte or eight bit long uh, memory, right? So it's going to occupy a memory space of four bytes uh, uh, if, if you have four A's, for example. So let's talk about a simple operation uh, based on what we learned so far. So let's take a look, look at the function here, which takes two arguments and two and three. In execution of any function, the first event is to store the argument into the stack using the push operation. Note that the arguments are pushed in reverse order. So then the return address or ret is pushed. This is the address of the next instruction to execute after the add function calls are finished executing. So in our case, the ret should be storing the address of the first instruction in the printf done by function. It is this address that gets stored in the EIP address in order to help the CPU know the next instruction to execute. Remember, the registers are more efficient for the CPU to use as variables rather than just fetching them directly from the memory. So coming back, the next object to get stored in memory is the value of retrieved from the EBP register. So this value is nothing but an address to an area in memory. Again, at the end of the current function, this value is popped back to the EBP register. So that's why I have mentioned it as EBP's value, right? Not as EBP. Finally, the local variable value zero is stored, and this value is four bytes long. If you remember, we are actually storing the address of the value, not the value itself. 
So let's take a look at how a buffer overflow works. We already looked into this, so let's skip over to that. So consider this example of this get input function, which allocates eight bytes of space in memory for the variable called buffer. It then receives input from user using the static input and stores the variable buffer, um, stores it in the variable buffer using the gets. Finally, it outputs the content of the buffer uh, using the puts function into the standard output. The problem here is that the gets does not, the gets that you're looking at, the gets buffer function that's executing does not check the whether size of the input is larger than the target buffer variable. So when an input of 16 bytes, for example, which is greater than the size of the buffer is supplied, the gets function overwrites the EBP and red blocks in the diagram and thus causing an overflow. As an attacker, if you're able to write the red block with an address of an area in memory where you have placed the shellcode, the shellcode will be executed after the get input function returns. And that's how a stack based buffer overflow attack works. I hope you understood the basics uh, in the theory so far. Uh, I will show you how to exploit this uh, in a simple demo for the same program that we are looking at. So as explained before, uh, as an attacker, I'm going to supply an evil input, which is 16 A's, and the program is going to copy the first 8 A into the allocated 8 bytes, and then copy over the remaining 8 onto the EBP and red blocks. That's, you know, basically causing corruption in the memory. So let's take a look uh, in our sample program. So I'm looking at this function, buff.c. As you can see, it's the same function that we saw earlier. It's, it has a buffer variable declared with a uh, size eight bytes. It's going to get a buffer. It's going to get an input from the user and stores in, uh, store it in the buffer. And I'm going to put it back onto the standard output using the puts function. So without further talking, let's take and try and exploit this. So it's right now it's waiting for user input. Let's first give a regular input and it's going to put it back. So this time I'm going to execute. Um, I'm going to provide an input longer than 16 bytes. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And I'm going to put another one just so we are overflowing it. 17. As you can see, we have a segmentation fault. So I hope you learned uh, how a simple stack-based buffer overflow uh, uh, works. So in the next video, I will show you how to exploit a sample program in Windows. Uh, until then, decrypt.